Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Lamb, and I'm the external managing editor of the Duke Forum for Law and Social Change. And I'd like to welcome those of you who are just joining us. For those of you who have been with us through the morning and seen the panels and the breakout sessions, we welcome you again. And we also like to extend a special thank you for those who have joined us for those sessions. It is with great pleasure that I welcome the next portion of our conference, our keynote luncheon. I'm honored to introduce Mary Rose Okar, president of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee based in Washington, DC. Ms. Okar received her BA at Ursuline College, an MA at John Carroll University, studied at Westham Adult College in Workshire, England, and had further study at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. She has also received numerous honorary doctorate degrees of law and humane letters from various academic institutions. Ms. Okar has served in all three levels of legislative branches in government, city, state, and federal. As a member of the Cleveland City Council, member of the Ohio House of Representatives, and a 16-year member of the United States Congress representing Cleveland, Ohio, and 16 suburbs. In the United States Congress, Ms. Okar was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives leadership as vice chair of the Democratic Caucus. In addition, she served as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as a U.S. parliamentarian. While in Congress, she chaired several important committees, including the International Banking Committee, which oversaw the IMF, the World Bank, and the multilateral financial institutions. In addition, she served on the Housing Committee, which included oversight of the historic pre preservation. She is also well known for her work on peace and justice and has received numerous awards for her work on Central America and the Middle East from varieties of organizations. She was appointed by Vice President Al Gore to the Board of Builders for Peace and Economic Development in the Middle East. She has also served as a monitor for Palestinian and Czechoslovakian elections. She has attended Middle East peace signings at the White House in Egypt and in Jordan. After the peace signing between Israel and Jordan, she accompanied President Clinton to Syria aboard Air Force One. In addition to having served in public office, Ms. Okar is currently National President of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, ADC. ADC is a non-sectarian, non-partisan, grassroots civil rights organization founded 29 years ago. ADC works in coalition with other colleagues in civil rights organizations to champion legislation to fight hate crimes and end racial profiling, as well as protecting our civil liberties and civil rights. Today, she will discuss her experiences as president of ADC and many of the trials and tribulations that her organization seeks to eliminate. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Okar. Well, thank you uh, very much, Stephanie, and I want to uh, congratulate Duke um, University. Uh, I think this is the kind of forums we should have uh, related to uh, problems with social change, social justice, et cetera. So this forum is so impressive. I'm only sorry that I got here this morning and, and could not attend all the things that uh, all the wonderful, wonderful presentations uh, I know I would have learned a lot. I want to say uh, to all of you, uh, I happen to be a Christian of Arab American ancestry, but I want to say salam alaikum to um, all the people who are here. I understand the board chairman of CARE is somewhere in the building. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I'm proud of you, Senator, and proud of Keith Ellison and all the other uh, people that are in public office who happen to be Muslim. Um, <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> Stephanie, I want to thank you for organizing uh, my trip here. You went through a few little things there, and uh, uh, we're especially uh, grateful uh, to you. Everybody in my office loves you, so anytime you come to Washington, they all want to take you out to lunch or something. So, um, <clears throat> But anyway, the new face of discrimination. Well, there's no question that I'll bet everybody in this room, at one point or another in their lifetime, will or has experienced discrimination. Um, <clears throat> I always think of the people with whom I served, particularly in Congress. Uh, one of my favorite people was, uh, is Norm Mineta, who is a Japanese American, uh, was the only Democrat in, uh, as a cabinet member, Secretary of Transportation, during the um, Bush years recently. Uh, and uh, was interned in an internment camp when he was a young boy. And he did the legislation that symbolically gave some money to 
Japanese who had suffered uh, during World War II in that period. Well, he was recruited in the Army uh, after, um, while he was in the internment camp and, and became a pilot and was decorated by the United States Army. Uh, and of course, uh, his memories of that terrible experience um, was obvious. Uh, to all of us, and he was and, and is one of my favorite heroes. Um, certainly, um, blacks, Jews, Hispanics, uh, women, gays, we go on and on and on uh, about discrimination, and we haven't solved it. And somebody said to me the other day, well, don't you understand that it's your turn now? And I said, what? What kind of a statement is that, my turn? And we wish we didn't have to have civil rights organizations. But ADC, <clears throat> and Stephanie told you a little bit about us, we're actually 30 years old now. Uh, we were founded by uh, Senator Jim Aberesk, and we're the only Arab American group that is part of something called the US Leadership Conference, which has more than 200 civil rights groups that work in coalition related to protecting the rights of our people uh, and immigrants and others, but uh, Americans. And we're an American organization. I always tell my staff, uh, the White House belongs to you as much as it does President Obama. Uh, people used to come to my congressional office and be awestruck, and they were my constituents who put me there. I said, this is your office, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> um, when Senator Aberes founded it, you may not know this, because some of you are perhaps too young to remember, uh, but he founded it after an incident called Abscam. Does anybody know what that was? You do, okay. Well, what it was, was there were vulnerable members of Congress, just as they're vulnerable members of any institution, I think, uh, four or five guys that were interested in taking money under the table, which is illegal, you know? And so what the FBI did and the Justice Department did was they put uh, a pretend sheik who looked like a Saudi dressed in, you know, the robe and, and, the, and so forth. Uh, and this guy set these guys up and offered them money under the table. And of course, there were cameras hidden in the congressional offices. And it came out. Uh, and they convicted five or four or five members of Congress of taking money illegally uh, and so forth. But the outrage that Jim had, Senator Aberes from South Dakota had, and other members of Congress, and I was a new member of Congress then, was that no ethnic group should be used uh, as a racial profiling kind of thing. It wasn't an Arab who set them up or a sheep from the Gulf area. It was, in fact, um, an actor. But the American people didn't know that. And the reason they didn't know that was because the media showed the film of these fellows uh, taking this money from this pretend sheik. Uh, and they never clarified, most of the media did not clarify that the guy was an actor. He was not really, of that ancestry. So uh, Jim decided to find this organization, and he asked me and uh, Congressman Nick Rahal, who's still in Congress from West Virginia, uh, I suppose because of our ancestry, uh, to uh, get a letter from members of Congress. So I went to uh, uh, a fellow who was my classmate. We came in together, Ted Weiss, who happened to be Jewish. And I thought, if I can get Ted to sign this letter saying no ethnic group should ever be used, a religious group should be used in this way. And he was happy to sign it. And so I got Norm Mineta and, and <clears throat> Lou Stokes, who happens to be black, Congressman Stokes uh, from my hometown of Cleveland, and <clears throat> uh, uh, Italian-Americans. It, it wasn't hard to get members of Congress, believe it or not, to sign a letter saying, do not use an ethnic group in the manner in which you used them for this setup to, to get individuals. Uh, so that's how ADC was founded, as a civil rights group. Lots of groups have civil rights groups. Hispanics do, 
Blacks have the NAACP and others. Jews have ADL. Uh, Japanese and Asians uh, and other Asians have other groups. And <clears throat> Polish Americans have the Polish American Congress. I mean, it's, it's common to have a civil rights group and a group that works for your ethnicity and so on. And so what we do at uh, ADC is we work in coalitions whenever we can with the members of the U.S. Leadership Com Conference. Uh, we have an individual who's supposed to be here today, but his baby is in the hospital. He just he and his wife just had a new a new son, and so he's at the hospital. But Noir Shora, who happens to be uh, Arab American and Muslim, does diversity training to a lot of government officials and legal people. He just did the entire Washington D.C. police force about who are Arabs, who are Muslims. He just wrote a fabulous book that, I, Stephanie, I'm going to send you his book uh, that is now being used in some of the campuses, you know, on Arab culture and Muslim culture, et cetera. He's really terrific, and he's a lawyer uh, to boot. Uh, so he does a lot of our training and our uh, legal rights uh, work. We have publications like the Hate Crime Report that we give to the FBI. Uh, we work in coalitions to end racial profiling, which honestly could, could happen to every single person here. Believe me, even those of you who happen to be white and blonde-haired and blue-eyed, I'm telling you, if one person experiences discrimination, it can happen to everybody if we allow it. And that's the premise in which uh, we operate. Um, and so... Um, uh, we just helped pass the hate crime bill, which was Senator Kennedy's bill, last bill, before he passed away. And um, all of the groups worked together and so forth. Um, <clears throat> ADC has um, that wonderful food. You know, I shouldn't have had so much. But anyway, uh, ADC uh, has access uh, to... Uh, divisions of the government, and that's one of the things we're American, and we want to work within the framework of the government. And if we don't like the policies, we want to change them, and that's that's the way I feel about it. Uh, and so, uh, a few days ago, we met with Attorney General Eric Holder, uh, who uh, certainly has his hands full these days, and we wanted to express to him. There were five of us who met with him, and we wanted to express to him uh, some of our concerns, which I will discuss today. Um, and he was very, very open about them, and he's inherited some of our concerns from the previous administration. Um, a recent Gallup poll uh, said uh, that religious, they, they had a Gallup poll on religious perception in the United States. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Um, <clears throat> but the attitudes toward Muslims in the US of all the faiths had the most negative views. And we can decipher how that's happened, uh, et cetera. 53% uh, of all Americans had a negative viewpoint toward the Muslim religion. 60, however, here's the thing that I found interesting, and I couldn't help thinking of my mother. 63% of the people that were in this poll said they didn't know anything about the religion. They didn't know anything about the religion. My mother used to say, you cannot appreciate something you don't know. Uh, and she, obviously, she's right. I mean, they didn't know that... Uh, Noir was telling me he was giving a um, diversity training to a bunch of lawyers in these big law firms in Washington. And one of the lawyers afterward came in, he was explaining who are Arabs, who are Muslims, who are this, who are that. And one of the lawyers came up to him and said, I did not know that Muslims, like Christians, believe in one God, and like Jews. And that's the fundamental premise, I think, of the three, three of the great religions and so forth. Um, and, and he said, thank you very much. Now, here's something very important. Not all Arabs are Muslims. Not all Muslims are Arabs. Um, <clears throat> in fact, 
Only 18%, I shouldn't say only, but 18% of the worldwide population of Muslims happen to be from the 22 countries that speak Arabic as their major language. Uh, some are in North Africa, the Gulf, and the Levant area, and that would be Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, etc. Um, however, today, uh, the Arab community, by the way, I happen to be Christian. I'm wearing this cross. You say, well, are you showing off your religion? No. But it was my great-grandmother's that she brought when she <laughs> came to this country. And I just feel better wearing it, that's all. So, uh, you know, it's not to, you know, put that in your face or anything. Um, but at any event, um, the largest populated country is where President Obama spent part of his youth, Indonesia, uh, and um, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Nigeria, etc., cetera, um, happen to be the larger uh, countries that uh, have uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim religion as their major um, religion. So, um, so we're talking about South Asians, Africans, and people from Arabic countries. Um, uh, since 9-11, however, Arabs and Muslims have been confused to mean the same thing. Now, if you walked into ADC's door, we would not ask you your nationality or your ethnic background, I should say, or your religion. Um, we just serve you because that's what we do. Uh, so we have Pakistanis that come in, we have uh, Iranians, we have everybody who comes in. The Sikh community sought our help because they were perceived as being Muslim and being Arab. You know, they wear the turbans and all. And, and um, we helped them form an organization and got them uh, to the meetings that we, were, we were, had access to. Now, <clears throat> one of the great things about our country, in my judgment, the United States, is even if we don't like the laws, every department has a civil rights division. And so we go primarily, we don't meet Eric Holder every day. I just want you to know that. Uh, we'd like to sometimes, but we can't always do that. But we go to the civil rights uh, divisions, uh, and, and, um, and we have gotten other groups invited, because at first we were the only ones going to them with our egregious cases and so forth, and we thought that we should have South Asians come, and we thought the six should come, and we thought a lot of people should come. Um, so what about the post 9-11 uh, policies? I don't have to say this, but I'm going to anyway. Obviously, we abhorred the terrorist attacks of, of uh, 2001 and any violence. We are a nonviolent um, association. We love Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, and people of that nature, and Gandhi, and so on, who uh, want to protect rights by nonviolent means. Um, the unfortunate and very ineffective in cosmetic actions that were taken right after 9-11 um, left a very bitter taste uh, within the Arab, Muslim, South Asian communities, and a mark of shame on them um, and, and provided a lot of fear uh, to these people. Uh, many of the people who were American, second or third generation, were afraid to vote, you know, because their name uh, sounded a certain way. Um, <clears throat> and over the past nine years, we think the government, even if we don't like the policies all the time, has tried to take constructive, uh, proactive steps by meeting with us at least and having dialogue. I always tell uh, the lawyers on my staff, you could belong to the biggest law firm, but I don't think you'd ever get a meeting with the Attorney General of the United States of America, or the head of Homeland Security, uh, or even the President or the Secretary, um, <clears throat> Secretary Clinton. Um, and we do, we think that's very, very constructive, and we're grateful uh, to them. However, Many of the challenges remain tremendously unsolved. Um, <clears throat> many of these so-called counterterrorism uh, programs that were initiated by the government without the, a law being passed, by the way, it was just administrative branch can do that, 
uh, in 2001 and 2002 directly targeted communities based on national origin. Unfortunately, or anybody perceived to be. Uh, you could be non-Arab or non-Muslim or non-anything, and if you looked a certain way, you would be treated differently, um, uh, and so forth. And many of these people have come to us um, with that problem. With the latest, even today, with the latest TSA directives, national origin is going to be a factor for anybody from 14 different countries. Now, they always throw in one country that you don't think of. Uh, all these countries, the 13 pre countries, are predominantly Arab. I mean, and Muslim, I should say, Muslim. Um, and they threw in Cuba so that people thought, you know, uh, <laughs> they were being a little more broad-minded. Now, um, uh, and, and, and if Americans go to those countries, if I wanted to visit my relatives in Lebanon, for example, as an American, you know, uh, they would probably treat me differently because of the new laws, because of this Nigerian kid that uh, they messed up, didn't they? You know, the father goes to the embassy and says, my kid is being brainwashed. And the red flags were up about this kid all over the place. And yet um, he still uh, got on that plane uh, and could have blown up the plane. But to prejudge 700 million people is really uh, something that uh, we feel is problematic. Um, we didn't say, listen, uh, Timothy McVeigh committed the second worst terrorist, terrorist act in the United States. Did we say every blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy of his background is a problem? Of course not, and if we did, we ever stereotype, shame on us. And uh, many groups have been uh, stereotyped. So they promoted this program such as the infamous, and I don't know if you've heard of this, I, I assume you have, NSERS. What does that stand for? National Security Entry Exit Registration System, commonly known as Special Registration. Um, then they promoted the FBI voluntary interview, the initiatives, and the multiple watch and no fly lists. Um, are you familiar with MSIRS? How many are? I'm just curious. Okay. One, two. Okay. So I'll try to explain it um, a little bit. Um, the DOJ, the Justice Department, created NSEERS. Um, known as special regis uh, registration, in 202 to allegedly counter terrorism. Um, it required male visitors aged 16 and over from predominantly mu Muslim countries and North Korea, you know, they had to throw in North Korea, and nobody comes from North Korea, but they <laughs> put it in, uh, uh, to report to, um, uh, to face Registration in, out, during the time they're here. I won't go into all the details, but they have to register a number of times. Okay? Uh, the most controversial part of the program uh, is known as the domestic call-in, where they require men, now 25 and over, predominantly, again, from Muslim and Arab countries, to report to immigration offices whenever they call on them for uh, fingerprinting, again, photographs, and lengthy questionings. Um, <clears throat> there are criminal and civil penalties, uh, and you can go into a detention center, ter uh, uh, center, et cetera, if you don't register. Now, let me give you an example of when people didn't register. We had an example of, uh, oh, I just want to say this first. 82,000 people from those countries who were here, 82,000 volunteered, went forward, they were supposed to volunteer, and let th them know where they were, what they were doing. A lot of them were students, okay? 13,000 of the uh, those were deported for the most part. Most of them were deported because of the NSEERS program. And if they didn't have this program, they wouldn't have been deported. Some of them had a visa that had expired for two days or something, deported. And that doesn't 
uh, happen if you're from some other countries. Um, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> not one of them was ever accused of a terrorist act, and yet we still have that program today. Uh, we have something similar called the U.S. Visit Program. Are you familiar with that? If you come from certain countries, like even Brazil or South America, uh, European countries are accepted. They take your picture and they fingerprint you. So we say, well, if you had that, and you do that to these people from these countries anyway, why don't you just use that? That's much more relevant. Let me give you an example of some of the problems with this. Um, we had 40 Kuwaiti students from Kuwait who were in their senior year uh, at various institutions in Washington, D.C. They went to Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., and they were supposed to register out. They were supposed to get their passports stamped. Well, the office wasn't open. It was supposed to be open from 8 to 4 or something. They got there at 2 o'clock. Nobody was there. These young people thought, well, they're not here, so we're getting on the plane. We, we're going home. Guess what? They couldn't come back to the United States because they had not their uh, passport stamped. Now, <clears throat> we took that uh, to the... Um, what became uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, at the time Tom Ridge uh, from uh, Pennsylvania, somebody I served with in the House of Representatives, was the head of Homeland Security. What was Homeland Security and what is it today? What they did legislatively was transfer 200,000 federal employees from the Justice Department, the Treasury Department, et cetera, and put them under one umbrella. The Secretary of, of um, Homeland Security today is uh, Secretary Napolitano. And one of my staff members, uh, Kareem Shara, who was with ADC for 10 years, they just recruited away from me, and now he's a special advisor to her. One of the first Muslim individuals ever, ever um, uh, have that kind of contact. He's an outstanding young man. At any event, we teamed up with the, forgive me for saying this, but from the, with the Penn State School of Law to do a report on ANSEERS. Uh, and they took, they did a terrific, they did a great job in helping us. Um, they analyzed the legal and policy implications of ANSEERS. They looked through the cases related that were litigated. They provided recommendations one of which to the Obama administration, and they called for the termination um, uh, of NSEERS. Uh, if you want to get that report, you can go to our website and look under publications, and our website is adc.com, um, uh, so you, you can get the whole report printed out if you want it. Um, recently, we had 48 organizations most of which were non-Muslim, non-Arab, non, you know, <clears throat> just civil rights organizations, joining us in a letter asking the IG of Homeland Security to audit the NSEERS program, to let the government decide its value. And we're very, very happy about that. I want to tell you a little bit about Operation Frontline that used the NSEERS database. Uh, now, remember who the NSEERS database is. They're the people who are Muslim, essentially, from a number of countries, not just Arab countries, but all over the world. This is how they played politics, we believe, with NSEERS, among other things. <clears throat> Using the NSEERS database, uh, they called this Operation Frontline. And by the way, so that you know that we do relate to the government and that we're not always on the other side, Noir Shora takes the new recruits for the FBI and educates them about who are Muslims, who are Arabs, who are you know, people that are perceived to be. And he's written this great book. So, <clears throat> but we, we have to s tell them when they're way off. Um, what was Operation Frontline? Um, this came to light when people start complaining uh, to us 
during the 2004 presidential election uh, and until the 2005 presidential inauguration uh, of the October plan, right before the election. Uh, and we felt, our people in Dearborn, Michigan, you know, one out of three people in Dearborn, Michigan are um, Arab, and many of whom happen to be Muslim, for example. And in Dearborn, they, ICE, which is part of um, Homeland Security, uh, was knocking down doors and, you know, looking at their homes and so on. And many of these people had relatives who were students at the University of Michigan, but the relatives were American about to vote. Well, we felt that this October plan, since Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and states like that are toss-up states, you know, that it was intentional to scare them from voting. Now, maybe we were wrong, but Yale School of Law, again, forgive me, uh, and ADC, under the Freedom of Information Act, said, when you had this program called Operation Frontline, while you were looking for various people who were uh, suspected terrorists, um, what did you use as your database and we found out it was NSEERS. They didn't go after anybody else but the people who had registered under NSEERS. And so uh, the, Yale school, the Yale Law and some of the professors there are in litigation with ICE, which is part of Homeland Security related to um, that uh, Operation Frontline because the Freedom of Information Act told us an awful lot about what they did. Uh, and it's not very pleasant when you think that uh, you're American and that these kinds of things are happen to, to, we believe, intimidate. Then there's the FBI voluntary um, interview initiatives. Um, uh, another program adopted by our government a few years back under the umbrella of counterterrorism. Um, it demonstrated that the individual constitutional liberties and protections were being used by um, the FBI and others in its threat kind of assessment processes. So let me give you an example. They would go to somebody's place of work. Now you know right now, if, if the FBI knocked on your door where you work and said, we'd like to see that employee, we have some questions for the employee um, do you think your, your colleagues would think something was wrong with you or that you were under some suspicion? Well, that was part of it. Uh, and they even asked, uh, interviewed all these people, some of whom at work, um, and then what they did was they would ask people, um, they would go to restaurants um, because they gave some of the jurisdiction to the police force, which they shouldn't do, since that's not their cup of tea. And they look at what these people were eating. We just ate an Arabic meal. You know, um, that hummus was pretty good. <laughs> if you were eating hummus or tabbouleh at this restaurant, you had a good chance, if they were floating around, that you were going to be investigated. It had nothing to do with whether you were suspected of it, anything uh, and so forth. They would ask people about your religious affiliation in these interviews, which they didn't have to go through any real process for this voluntary so-called interview. They would ask you uh, what you thought about the war in Iraq. What did you think about the Israeli-Palestinian problems? Um, things that um, were bound to intimidate certain people, uh, and these were these interviews, and after that, if they had the least suspicion that you were a problem, then you would, you would uh, have some real difficulties in protecting your civil rights. Um, now what about the watch and no fly list? This is, this is my favorite story. Uh, this is my favorite subject in a way. And I mean this because any, uh, anybody here ever be stopped at an airport and said, you have been, all right. Would you stand up, please? I, I was actually stopped. I was much, I was much younger. But I was stopped because my passport showed that I had been to Tunis. And I was stopped because I was wearing a watch. And I was stopped because I was wearing a watch. And I was stopped because I was wearing a watch. And I was stopped because I was wearing a watch. And I was stopped because I was wearing a watch. And I was stopped because I was wearing a watch. And I was stopped because I was wearing a watch. And I was st
so they called me into the bathroom and searched everything. I had like a lot of uh, hand luggage that I had taken on. Uh, but they went through absolutely everything. And uh, so I asked them, what, what was it about me? They said, well, you have a, you've been doing a lot of traveling. Uh, and one of the places you went was Tunis. So that uh, that was the real reason that I was stopped, because of my visit there. Do you think it had anything to do with the color of your skin? Um, well, I think initially um, they were surprised that as a black person I had done so much traveling. <laughs> <laughs> of course, black people don't Europe travel. And so forth. Um, but then I think they became more suspicious when they saw that I had actually visited um, Tunis, as opposed to just going, you know, to Italy and Spain, <laughs> Sweden, places like that, friendly territories. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what is this no-fly list? Well, it's a it's a, a list of individuals based on your name, okay? <laughs> Pretty much your name. They don't have a lot of other stuff. Let me give you an example. There's a little kid named Mohammed Mohammed, five years old. And he's going to Egypt with his parents. And his father has a green card. His mother is a naturalized American citizen. And she's going to her sister's wedding. They came to ADC on this case. And uh, they say to the, the parents, you can get on the plane, but he can't go. <laughs> and I mean, you know, they're pretty good parents. So they say, well, we're not going to do that. So they call ADC. They miss the flight. They happen to be members of ADC, which, by the way, any of you can join if you want. Um, and they say, uh, you can get on the plane. He can't get on the plane. And his name is very similar to somebody else's name. And they're not used to Arabic-sounding names or Muslim-sounding names. And I'm not just, in, you know, I said they think Muslims are Arabs, Arabs are Muslim, and yet they're from all over the world, you know. But anyway, another case, lest you think it only happens to people who happen to be Muslim. Well, anyway, they called us, and the next day they went, and they gave him a first-class ticket and apologized. But think about it, you know. Senator Kennedy even was stopped once. Remember that? He had a name similar to somebody named Kenny or something like that, and he... Then I remember his calling our office and saying, I just got stopped and now I know what you're talking about. And they didn't care. Honestly, he said, I'm Ken Senator Kennedy. Is my, ugh. And they, um, whatever. But here's another one of my favorite stories in this about this no fly list. Um, there's a priest, Catholic priest, lest you think it only happens. It's perception is reality with some of these people. And a lot of people that uh, do not know uh, too much about uh, cultures and so on. And I, I say this about myself. I wish I knew more about people who are Hindu and other religions and so forth, and I don't. I mean, I know a little bit, but not very much. And, and we as Americans have to be a little more into understanding various cultures because we're a global society. And we should know the difference. I bet we couldn't name all the uh, countries in Africa or who the Middle Eastern countries are or whatever, you know. And uh, listen, I'm including myself in that. But here's, here's a story about Father Emil. Father Emil addresses the Catholic bishops of America. Every year for 13 years, he's in charge of all the holy sites um, in the Holy Land. Okay, you know, where Christ was born and died and so on. And he's a Catholic priest. And he's Jordanian. And he's coming over here and he's dressed as a priest, you know, with the collar and all that. And he's coming over here and the Catholic bishops call ADC. This is one of the first cases that I personally got involved in when I started at ADC. And the Catholic bishops' lawyers call us and Kareem comes in, uh, who used to be with us, uh, and he says, Mary Rose, there are lawyers on the phone, and this Catholic priest is being stopped in Toronto for three weeks and questioned. And they want to know if we'll help. And I said, What's he, what are they asking him? He said, well, he's given his visa's perfect. 
He's given this talk 13 years in a row to the Catholic bishops about how the sites are doing and whether they're being taken care of, et cetera, and so forth. So I, by a miracle, got a hold of Tom Ridge, who I had served with. And Tom, it was a miracle, because I didn't expect to get him on the phone. Anyway, I got him on the phone. And Tom says, Mary Rose, I don't even know about this case. I, you know, I just started here. I said, well, Tom, this Catholic priest has been stopped three weeks in a row. All the Catholic bishops are waiting to hear, hear his talk. He's done it 13 times in a row. We checked out his visa. It's a good visa. What's the deal? So about two days later, he gets out of Toronto and uh, from the connecting flight from Jordan, and he comes to see me uh, and Kareem and others on our staff to thank us for making that phone call. And I said, Father, what did they ask you? And he said, Mary Rose, do you know the first question they asked me? And I said, I can't imagine. He said, Father, are you a Christian Muslim? <laughs> and he said, these are our people that were working there. Uh, he said, he said um, no, but we all believe in one God. So I guess you could call me a Christian. Well, anyway, that was the first question. And he still doesn't know why they stopped him. Um, so Homeland Security, this new omnibus agency, uh, has 200,000 or more federal employees. By the way, Noir made a, a disc for every one of the employees about who are Arabs, who are Muslims, et cetera, et cetera. It's, a, it's well done, and they gave it to every employee, which is, we're proud of doing that, but it still doesn't solve the whole problem because the policies are still there. Uh, then there, and I'm almost finished here, uh, the Attorney General guidelines. Um, these were guidelines that uh, President Bush uh, um, uh, made guidelines, I should say the administration did, December 2008, one month before he left office. And basically what these guidelines do is they give federal law enforcement authorities carte blanche to conduct investigations of individuals on suspicion or questionable activity. Could be even eating in a restaurant, you know? But um, basically what they're changing is the investigations from evidence-driven to those potentially based on suspicion. And some of the suspicion is very superficial. Now these guidelines were based and expanded on the original guidelines of 2003 that said basically that you could um, racially profile people even though DHS or Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice says, I mean, it's like 1984, it, it doesn't, you know, it's ironic. They say one thing, that we don't believe in racial profiling, but they do, because it's based on racial profiling, and that's how it started. Um, and, and basically, these guidelines, that's what we met with Attorney uh, General Holder about, because Senator Kennedy, um, Senator Feingold, Senator Durbin, Senator Leahy, Leahy chairs the, the committee, wrote a letter saying, those guidelines should have been brought before Congress. There is a checks and balance system in this country, and you didn't do that. And we want to know why you didn't tell us. They had to read about it in the paper, that they, these guidelines were coming out. And they're still after them to... Uh, tell them, even if it's in a closed session where nobody else could know about it, it's confidential, and they still haven't done it, and they're still insisting on it. So if you feel, as I do, that that's important, then you might want to thank them or ask your own senators and Congress members to do the same thing. Um, we have, uh, just finally, so many employment cases um, now that the economy is terrible, I could give you, if you want to hear them, you could ask me a question about them, but <clears throat> where people are called names, where they're fired. One of the cases that I had a little bit to do with, because I'm not a lawyer, you know, I'm an old school teacher, uh, politician, I guess you'd say. Um, 
But one of the cases that I intervened on uh, was uh, a pilot who flew for 30 years, 28 years, for a very major firm. And he's Lebanese-American, third generation. His grandparents came, you know, like in the 1890s or something. Had an impeccable record. You know they laid him off? They laid him off, and they had no reason. And he, he didn't want to complain because he wanted, he wanted his job back. Well, we, um, we intervened with him and filed an EEOC thing and all that. And, you know, his life will never be the same. He got his back pay, and, you know, they were apologized and all that. But his life will never be the same because everybody's going to think that, that they don't want to get on the plane with him. And it was ridiculous. There was nothing there, and there was not the due process and all the things related to uh, telling him his rights and you know all that. I mean, unbelievable. Um, just one last case that, that calls to mind. I wonder what you would have done. President Bush was having a fundraiser toward the end of his term uh, at a hotel in Maryland. And um, the key waiter was a, a, a fellow named Mohammed Khalil or something. He was the chief waiter. And all the chief waiter does, they don't serve the president. They make sure everything's on time. And, you know, it was a big fundraiser, and they were excited. The president was coming. And, you know, the, the management, he had been employed there 15 years. Secret Service came in, and they wanted to know the name of all the just the name of all the waiters. And this guy's name was Muhammad. And they wouldn't let him be in the room. Now, what would you have done? You know, he wasn't even serving the food. And they said, no, you can't do that. Well, he came to see us, and we got an apology from the Secret Service. But he'll never be the same at his job. I, I really mean that. I mean, I don't think, I think the hotel management loves him. but. All of a sudden, his name's Muhammad. We had Mike Wallace uh, at our, um, uh, last year we had Clinton, but one of the awards we gave was to Mike Wallace for Lifetime Journalism Award. And Mike happens to be Jewish, probably know. And he was really terrific. And he said, you know, I never realized that if your name was Muhammad, that that was going to be a problem. And we also gave an award to a fellow who is head of Arab News, the largest Arab American newspaper in Michigan. And his name is Osama Sablani. So we give the award to Mike Wallace, who's talking about everybody whose name is Muhammad. And Osama Sablani says, how would you, Mr. Wallace, I'm honored to be given an award the same day you are, but how would you like it if your first name was Osama? And you know, and, and he said, you know, that's right. Um, so we believe in national security. We want our government to have national security. We don't want it to take away civil rights and civil liberties. And we don't want people, anybody, to generalize about anybody. To generalize about everybody, millions and almost two billion people. Um, so I think there's a real lesson to be learned. We don't want people to be stripped of something the United States holds very sacred. I think President Obama, and it's, we're nonpartisan, by the way. I happen to be, have been elected as a Democrat. But I do think that President Obama stuck his neck out and did something very important when he gave that speech to the Muslim world. Because it, it made them realize that we do not believe in religious discrimination in this country. And that he had, even though he doesn't practice it, his father happened to be a Muslim from Kenya. You know, I think that that was very gutsy of him. Because it's not common to do that. Now, I haven't mentioned uh, anything about immigration. I mean, you don't even, we could spend hours on that. Um, and how they make some people who have gone through the whole process, and after you take the test and everything, it's supposed to take 60 days or something like that, and people have been waiting six and eight and 10 years uh, for no good reason. Um, but the fact is that when one person, remember, is discriminated against, we all have the potential of facing that. 
And I hope we all can work collectively, not only for Muslims, not only for Arabs, not only for uh, various groups that have faced it very out there in our nation's history, Native Americans, uh, American Indians, etc., but for all of us to protect our country because it's a sacred gift to be um, an American in my judgment and we really need to herald um, what our country stands for. Thank you very much. <laughs>